So good evening, everyone. And we're so glad that you're here tonight. Uh, I'm Andy Bird, and I'm a longtime organizer and activist for environmental and social justice concerns here in Maine. Uh, I'm a member of Maine Climate Action Now, which is hosting uh, tonight's program. Uh, Maine Climate Action Now is a coalition of grassroots organizations uh, promoting bold measures to address the climate crisis while we amplify the voices of our member organizations and especially youth, frontline communities, and others who historically have been excluded from the political conversation. Also hosting tonight's program and providing the technical assistance is Green Amendments for the Generations. And we're so grateful to both organizations for this collaborative support. Uh, before I lay out tonight's program and introduce you to our speakers, I want to give you just a brief history of how the Green Amendments movement came to Maine. About a year and a half ago, Michelle Henkin, who lives in New Harbor, read about the Green Amendments. She got in touch with Maya Van Rossum, the founder, and then Michelle and I, who had met while making window dressers, window mm -hmm. inserts, we got together where she shared Maya's book and the Green Amendment concept. We started to network, meeting first with our former state senator, Chris Johnson, and then just over a year ago with Representative Chloe Maxman on the porch to the Quaker Meeting House in Demerscata. Maya joined us there and Chloe became an enthusiastic sponsor to bring a Green Amendment to, for Maine to the state legislature. From the beginning, it was important to us to craft an amendment document with language that's inclusive and just and would stand up in court. And to that end, Chloe arranged a Zoom consultation on the Green Amendment with youth climate activists and Maya. We were eager to consult in person with leaders from every Wabanaki tribe on their reservations. And we have had a couple of consultations one in person in January and again with Maya participating. These conversations are ongoing. At this moment, we have draft language for a Green Amendment for Maine and we plan to introduce legislation this session for its passage. I will share more about the future at the end of this program. So on to the evening's program. Maya Van Rossum will lead off with a presentation on the Green Amendments for the Generations Movement that is sweeping the country and is taking root here in Maine. We will then hear from two main we will then hear two main stories from grassroots activists focused on past and present mining concerns in Aroostook County and the ongoing issues with toxic air pollution from the fossil fuel infrastructure in South Portland. Maya will then speak to how a green amendment had Maine had one in its constitution might have changed the two stories or could prevent such stories from emerging in the future. Next up will be Q and A facilitated by Maya and we will conclude the evening with next steps and how you can get involved. So, so that the program transitions smoothly, I'm going to introduce our three speakers now, and they will share their presentations one after another. First, we're very pleased to welcome tonight Shelley Mountain, who is a lifelong Aroostook County resident, and in her words, a reluctant environmental activist who became active when proposed mining threatened Aroostook County. In 2014, she was uh, recognized and honored for her leadership in the mining effort by the Maine Legislature and the Natural Resources Council of Maine. You will hear in her story tonight, her love for the land where she grew up and her continued concern to protect it. Our second main presenter is Roberta Zuckerman, one of the coordinators of Protect South Portland a grassroots nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote actions and practices that serve to protect the environment, health, and welfare of South Portland. 
Roberta was one of the people in Rachel Berger's living room when Protect South Portland started about eight years ago. For her organization, Roberta focuses primarily on outreach and engagement. She is passionate about bringing people together as a community to make a difference. She believes that together we are strong and she also sees as an important antidote to despair. Thank you, Roberta, for sharing the Protect South Portland story with us tonight. And now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Maya Van Rossum. Maya has served as the Delaware Riverkeeper and leader of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network since 1994, that's 26 years. She is the founder of the National Green Amendments for the Generations Movement. In her role as the Delaware Riverkeeper, Maya has dedicated her life to being the voice of the Delaware River. She's taken on industry, government, and even the US Army, preventing harm to the river, communities, and environment she bravely champions. Now Maya is working to empower in individuals like all of us across the nation to stand up for their environment to rights by pioneering the Green Amendments movement. Thank you, Maya, for joining us tonight and for sharing your bold vision for transforming our world to the one we dream of waking up on every morning. Clean air, pure water, and a livable climate for today's and future generations. Thanks again for being here. Take it away. Oh my gosh, that is such a powerful, and beautiful introduction. Um, I hope I can live up to it. Uh, but I think more importantly, I just really want to um, say how honored I am to, to be able to partner with Andy and Michelle on this Green Amendments for the Generations Movement in the state of Maine. They are really powerful, powerful advocates and allies um, and a true inspiration. And so you all are very, very lucky to have them in the state. Um, and I'm so honored to be joined by Shelly and Roberta and to have this opportunity to share with all of you in the state of Maine um, what I believe to be a, a, a truly transformational movement when it comes to environmental protection and environmental justice um, protection. So uh, I don't need to go into my bio because Andy did it very eloquently and I thank you for that. I think the most important thing I want you to know about me is that I have in fact been leading environmental advocacy and litigation for over 26 years now to very literally fight the good fight for our beautiful Delaware River, its communities and its watershed. And this Green Amendments for the Generations movement is an outgrowth of that 26 years of advocacy. And through all of that hard work with all of the wonderful communities I have the honor of working with, learning how fundamentally our current system of environmental protection laws, whether you're talking about Maine or any other state across our nation, how this system of laws and government is truly and fundamentally failing us when it comes to environmental protection and recognizing that we truly do need a new path if we are going to um, protect our environment for present and future generations. Now, when people say, hear me say that we need a new path for environmental protection here in the United States, they're always quite shocked to learn that, right? And very quickly, um, you know, start to speak to me about, well, if you, if you look at Maine or if you look at, you know, our nation as a whole, we literally have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of environmental protection laws. And we have agencies and policies and programs and all kinds of things that are supposed to be focused on protecting our environment for all people. So how is it possible? How is it possible that we need a new path when we have all of these mechanisms for protection in place? Well, the problem with this system of government, this system of laws that we have in place, again, in Maine and in every state, is that fundamentally, they accept pollution and degradation as a foregone conclusion, a necessary evil, something that we will accept and accommodate and think about at the end of the decision-making process when our focus is going to be on how do we permit, literally issue a permit 
for the pollution and degradation that we are anticipating and accepting? How do we manage the who, the when, the where we're going to allow it to happen? This system of government and laws is not focused on how do we prevent pollution and degradation before it even starts. Of course, there are also a lot of gaps in the laws. There are a lot of things that are, are not regulated or not regulated until frankly, it's too late. Things like fracking or PFAS and PFAS, uh, the use of PFAS and PFAS chemicals that now contaminate so many drinking water supplies across our nation. Um, inevitably, even with the laws that we do have on the books, there's poor implementation for any number of reasons, right, wrong, or otherwise. Um, there's always some excuse as to why government is not, not fully implementing those laws. And at one point or another, somebody gets into political office that doesn't appreciate the power and importance of environmental protection and therefore works very, very quickly to roll back even the protections that we do have on the books. And sadly, the way these laws are written, is literally built in so that communities of color, indig indigenous communities, immigrant and low income communities are repeatedly and intentionally targeted for highly polluting industrial operations and environmentally degrading activities. And so as a result, we have communities across Maine and across our nation that are drinking contaminated water, breathing polluted air, species and habitats are being lost at an unacceptable rate. And of course, we are facing a climate crisis. And so we can see from this system of laws that something is truly missing. Right. We have all these laws on the books, and yet we are still suffering from all of this pollution and degradation. And so the question is, what is that something missing? In the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there's a, a, a Senator, Franklin Curry, who decades ago realized what that something missing was, or at least a very important something missing when it comes to protecting our environment. Senator Curry realized almost as soon as he was elected to office that we do not, we were not in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and we do not in states across our nation recognize and protect the rights of all people to clean water and clean air, a stable climate and healthy environments. And we don't recognize and protect these rights, these inalienable human rights in the same way we recognize and protect other fundamental freedoms we hold dear, things like the right to free speech, and freedom of religion. We don't recognize and protect environmental rights in the Bill of Rights section of our state and federal constitutions, which is in fact where we recognize and protect these other human, civil, and political rights we hold dear. And so Senator Curry decided he was going to change that. And as a result of Senator Curry's vision and his activities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution, there is Article 1, Section 27 that very literally recognizes and protects the rights of all people, including future generations, to clean air and pure water and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. And that recognizes the constitutional duty of all members of government from the local town council all the way up to the state legislature to protect the natural resources of the state for the benefit of all the people. It's very powerful language. Now, the first, though, while this language was actually added to the Pennsylvania Constitution in the early 1970s, its first most effective and powerful use was not until 2013, when I, in my role as the Delaware Riverkeeper and my organization, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, used it to challenge a very pro-fracking law that had been passed by the Pennsylvania legislature and signed by the governor. This was a law that actually was um, passed in 2012 and, and did a lot of horrible things when it came to fracking. It gave the industry the power of eminent domain um, in certain contexts. 
It relieved them um, of the, the duty to notify those who are on drinking on private drinking water wells that their drinking water had potentially been contaminated by uh, nearby fracking operations. It put in place automatic waivers for minimal environmental protection standards that applies to every other industry in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and much, much more. And long story short, while drilling and fracking was really having devastating impacts on the environments of the com and the communities of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania at the time, with the passage and the implementation of Act 13, things were poised to get dramatically worse for the people of Pennsylvania. Um, we at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network have been fighting fracking for many, many years. And we recognized that we had to find a way to take on this law. The thing is, what can you do when a law has been passed by the legislature and signed by the governor? governor? There really aren't too many options, right? You can, you can protest and maybe try to convince the legislators to repeal the law that they just passed. Well, that wasn't going to happen. Maybe you can get better people elected to office. So in the future, something better happens. But frankly, that'll come too late if the law is already being implemented. So you have to find some sort of higher power. And we reflected and realized that in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we had this higher power in that long ignored constitutional environmental rights amendment. And so we challenged the provisions of Act 13 that we were most concerned about. We challenged them claiming that they would result in a violation of the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. This case went all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which was led by a very conservative chief justice at the time. And we got an amazing victory in December of 2013, a victory that was actually, the plurality opinion was actually written by the chief justice of the court. And I want you to read with me just a few things that Chief Justice Ronald Castile wrote in the plurality opinion that he rendered in December of 2013. By any responsible account, the exploitation of the Marcellus Shale formation, drilling and fracking, will produce a detrimental effect on the environment, on the people, their children, and future generations. That the natural resources that were being harmed were resources essential to life, to health, and to liberty, and that as a result, the provisions of Act 13 that we were challenging were in fact unconstitutional because they would violate the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. In that moment, with that victory, we not only defeated some of the most devastating aspects of Act 13, but we very literally gave to the people of Pennsylvania their constitutional right to pure water and clean air and a healthy environment, rights that had been ignored for decades, but now had been restored because of our legal victory. Now, as I thought over time about the power and the importance of what we had accomplished with this victory, as we were going about doing the work of using this victory to prevent, protect other communities and other environments in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I realized that there was more in this victory than just for the people of Pennsylvania, that there was a message for all communities in all states across our nation the message that our rights to pure water and clean air, a stable climate and healthy environments are in fact inherent, inalienable, indefeasible rights that belong to us by the virtue of the fact that we are people here on this earth and that these are rights that are worthy, worthy of constitutional recognition and protection, just like those other fundamental rights that we hold dear. And that we need to have communities across our nation rise up together and demand and defend their environmental rights. And I do truly believe that the best way they can do that and that we can all do that is to rise up together and in fact demand constitutional recognition and protection of our environmental rights like we have in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We need to seek and secure the passage of green amendments in every state across our nation. What we need is a movement, what I call a green amendment movement. And why do we need a movement? 
because there are only two states that have a green amendment like Pennsylvania has. Pennsylvania and Montana, and that's it. There are a whole lot of other states that talk about the environment in their constitutions, but they don't rise to the level of meeting my definition of being a green amendment. They are not in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution protecting the environmental rights of all people, including future generations, to clean air and clean water, stable climate and healthy environments. They are not um, applicable to all levels of government from the town council up to the state legislature, and they are not self-executing, meaning that they don't have legal life just by virtue of the fact that they are placed in the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution, they require no laws passed by the legislature to make them enforceable and powerful. And they don't protect environmental rights on par with those other fundamental rights we hold dear. And so I have been going across the nation, right? I wrote the book, The Green Amendment, Securing Our Right to a Healthy Environment. I've been giving talks all across the nation, trying to educate communities and inspire them to join me in spreading the word about the power and importance of constitutional green amendments um, so that communities do in fact rise up together and seek to have them added to their state constitutions. We'll start with the states, We'll go to the federal constitution later. That's very intentional and strategic. Um, and I want you to know that we are having powerful, powerful um, engagement with communities across our nation. We actually have inspired Green Amendment proposals in five states already. There are four other states that are um, working hard to get a Green Amendment proposal as soon as possible. There are another five other states where we've got a lot of great grassroots organizing taking place or communications with legislators. Um, and we have more and more outreach every day. But Maine would be on the cutting edge if Maine were to go forth with a Green Amendment proposal. Now, really broad brush, just want to go over some of the fundamentals about how a Green Amendment would change things if it passed in the states. Most importantly, a Green Amendment does mean that our environmental rights are protected as powerfully <clears throat> as those other fundamental rights we hold dear. So think about how powerfully the right to free speech and freedom of religion are protected. Think about how powerfully gun rights are protected by government officials. Well, that same legal power and strength now comes to bear on the environment. It means that every government official at every level of government becomes duty bound to protect the environmental rights of all people. And they must protect those rights for both present and future generations. It means that there must be a focus on prevention of harm first. No longer are we starting from a place where, it, where we're accepting pollution and degradation as a foregone conclusion. No, no, no. Our government officials, when they're legislating, regulating, or permitting, they take a step back and they think, how can I avoid degrading the environment first? Now, why is that, you might ask? Well, let me just give you an example. Think about if your government officials were about to pass a law and their um, uh, advisors came to them and said, if you pass that law the way you're looking to pass it, you will infringe on the rights to free speech or you will infringe on gun rights or religious freedoms. What would be the first thing that those government officials would be duty bound to do emotionally what they would want to do morally what they would want to do legally what they would need to do. They would step back and they would say wait a second. How can I go about the business of crafting and passing this law in a way that avoids infringement on those constitutional rights because they're constitutionally bound to protect those rights from government infringement. Well, that same scenario now comes to play for the environment. They are told that they are about to pass a law or a regulation or issue a permit that might infringe on the environmental rights of their constituents. The first thing government officials would have to do is take a step back and see if there would be a way to avoid the infringement, prevent the harm. Green amendments are very powerful for strengthening environmental justice. 
<clears throat> because they mean that every individual has the same right to a healthy environment, no matter their race, their ethnicity, their income, where they live, they all have the same constitutional right to a healthy environment. And government officials become duty bound to protect the environmental rights of all the people and to protect those rights equitably for all the people. No more, no more sacrifice zones where you're sacrificing one community in order to benefit another. We have demonstrated in the courts that actually a Green Amendment makes sure that um, uh, government officials consider not just the facts surrounding the decisions that they're about to make, but also that they must consider the science and the impacts, including cumulative impacts, or their actions and activities will not be able to withstand a constitutional challenge. Um, environmental Green Amendments are very empowering for advocates, right? No longer um, are we viewed as just tree huggers and fish lovers. No longer are we wary about standing up to defend the forest or the wetlands or the waters that we hold dear and depend upon. Because no longer are we just rising up for something we believe in, rightfully so, but that we believe in. Now we are rising up to defend a constitutional right that belongs to all people. So we are truly recognized for what we truly are. United States patriots that are just rising up to defend the Constitution. It's a powerful transformational shift in how people view us and we view ourselves. The goal of a Green Amendment is to get better decisions in the first place, right? Advance the good, prevent the bad. But the truth is when we have a Green Amendment and when our government officials get it wrong, what a Green Amendment does is it gives us immediate access to the courts. So we can challenge the bad decisions, actions, or activities that government is engaging in that could or would infringe on our constitutional rights to a healthy environment. And so the question is for the people of Maine, is Maine in a moment in time when people are willing and wanting to realize and recognize that while the current system of environmental protection laws is fundamentally failing us, there is another path available. And that other path is the passage of green amendments to protect the environmental rights of all the people, including future generations. And so with that, I am going to end my screen share and I am going to pass the podium to, I forget who, remind me, Andy, is it Shelly or Roberta? It is to Shelly. Take it away, Shelly. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Maya and Andy. I became interested in the mining issue in 2011 when Representative John Martin proposed changing Maine's very protective mining law to accommodate Irving's proposal to mine for metals at Bald Mountain in Aroostook. Since the 1970s, I have been hearing about the potential of mining Bald Mountain and the value that would add to the local economy. John Martin was promising that advanced technology now allows for much safer mining. I was intrigued and started attending public forums to find out more. I quickly got discouraged when it became clear that job numbers were inflated and they would likely have to be filled out of state and out of country. Answers to questions about environmental impacts were vague. There was talk about reverse osmosis and promises from the landowner that treated water would be so safe he would drink it. I started searching for evidence of successful mine closings. At forums, I would ask for examples of mines that had been successfully closed. In 2014, the Maine State Geologist offered the Flambeau Mine in Wisconsin. I Googled it right then, and the first thing that came up was a Milwaukee Journal article about how that mine was still leaching toxins 14 years after it was reclaimed. I Googled it again in preparation for this and found that mining interests are still using it as an example of a successfully closed mine, and it is still leaching toxins into the water. During that same meeting, a hydrogeologist talked about using bactericides to reduce environmental impacts. I asked her about the impacts of bactericides. She responded that it would be similar to pesticides. There is always risk. That is the one universal truth about mining. 
there is always risk and there is no such thing as a safe way to do it none there are no examples of mines that have been success successfully closed because there are no magic technologies that render the environmental impacts harmless. A mine at Ball Mountain and its certain groundwater contamination would threaten the Fish River chain of lakes in Aroostook. I'm from, a, I'm from Portage Lake and I own a camp there. Portage Lake is in the Fish River chain and about 10 miles from Bald Mountain. Contamination of the lake would make the camp useless and unsellable. All property values in Portage would drop. I spend a lot of time in the woods. My husband and I fish most every weekend in the summer. It saved our sanity this summer. The Fish River chain has a reputation as one of the best brook fisheries in the world. Tourism, agriculture, and logging are vital, sustainable sources of jobs and economic health for Northern Maine. Any threat to clean water and air is a threat to those industries. In 2017, a compromise was reached between the LePage administration mining interests and the main environmental groups. The result was a bill that bans open pit mines over three acres. It bans wet tailings treatment and storage. It rains in Maine, so I don't know how you stop mining waste from getting wet. The law allows unlimited groundwater contamination within a mine area and limits it to 100 feet beyond the mine area. Again, it rains in Maine and water generally flows downhill. I don't know how groundwater can be limited to human concepts of where it is allowed. Environmentalists justified support of this to me by claiming that anything else was a ban on money, like that's a bad thing. I was promised that the law would be so onerous, no mining company would even attempt to do any mining in Maine. Within three months, the Canadian mining company, Wolfden Resources, was in the process of buying Pickett Mountain and announced plans to explore for mining. Pickett Mountain is in Penobscot County near Baxter State Park and the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. Within six months, Wolfden was drilling boreholes for exploration. The boreholes have been successful and exploration continues. Wolfden has applied to the Main Land Use Planning Commission to rezone for metallic mineral mining. Their application is incomplete and LUPC has asked for additional information about size, location, and waste treatment. Wolfden has not provided the information, rather they have hired a New Jersey law firm to assert that LUPC does not have a right to that information. Environmental groups and citizens wrote the LUPC to encourage them to remain firm in requiring the information. No one has contacted LUPC in support of less information. So far, the LUPC is holding firm. This is just the first step in the permitting process. Citizens will have to remain vigilant to ensure that whatever happens with mining doesn't cause environmental damage. How the LUPC handles rezoning issues and how the Maine Department of Environmental Protection handles permitting issues will depend on whether they are appointed by administrations that are friendly to the environment or friendly to the mining industry. Clean air and water are necessary for all life. Access to them should not be dependent on which political party holds office. It should not be dependent on whether environmental groups view any area as valuable enough use of their resources to make it a priority. It should not be dependent on ordinary citizens like me to defend it. The only effective way to safeguard access for all living things is constitutionally. Thank you. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Roberta Zuckerman. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and thank you everybody for, for uh, being here tonight. Uh, Protect South Portland was started almost eight years ago when a small group of concerned citizens were brought together by Rachel Berger in her living room. We heard that Portland Pipeline, a local oil company, was planning to pipe in tar sands from Alberta, Canada to our deep water port in South Portland. Tar sands oil is the heaviest, most carbon intensive and polluting crude in the world and its extraction has destroyed arboreal forests in Canada, 
the size of Spain. Portland Pipeline was planning to reverse an old pipeline built in 1941 and transport tar sands from Canada across northern New England and Sebago Lake, which provides 20% of our drinking water. They would need a city permit to build two 70-foot smokestacks um, next to a landmark lighthouse and scenic Bug Light Park. Those smokestacks would burn off highly toxic fumes into the air we breathe before loading the oil onto tankers in Casco Bay. After a long and intense campaign, the South Portland City Council, with the benefit of Maine's Home Rule Authority, passed the Clear Skies Ordinance to stop tar sands. Seven years later, the city has spent almost $3 million defending the ordinance in court, and it's not over. Today, South Portland, a city of 25,000, is still fighting to have clean air to breathe. We are one of the most densely populated communities in Maine. We also have 120 huge oil storage tanks very close to homes, schools. You can see the school playground here next to the tanks. Um, daycares, a community center, and senior housing. Next slide, please. Together, Altogether, seven different tank farm companies in South Portland are permitted by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to emit 630 million tons per year of volatile organic compounds, folks, into the air we breathe. Some of these tanks are over 100 years old, and for all these years, there has been no actual testing or monitoring of emissions. It turns out that the companies have been allowed to self-report their emissions using a formula created by the petroleum industry. So we have the fox guarding the hen house. Um, uh, <laughs> um, in 2012, the US Environmental Protection Agency under President Obama required global partners to actually test the emissions coming from their heated asphalt tanks, rather than relying on fuzzy math. Global had previously claimed that heated asphalt tanks did not emit enough volatile organic compounds to warrant being included in their reporting. Global is permitted by the DEP to emit more, no more than 21.9 tons of Vokes per year from its 12 tanks combined, but the testing showed that just two of their four heated tanks were found to have the potential to emit over 50 tons of VOCs per year, more than twice the total allowed amount. Negotiations went on between the federal government and global over seven years, finally ending in an extremely weak consent decree finalized in December of 2019 between the company the US Department of Justice under President Trump. The EPA filed a similar lawsuit against another tank farm operator, Sprague, ending in another consent decree. Global, Sprague, and the main DEP have continued to dispute the validity of the test results over many years. Over the past 18 months, the citizens of South Portland have been mobilizing by attending multiple workshops and meetings, testifying, submitting comments to the DEP, writing letters to the editor and our city councilors. We have approximately 1,500 children attending K through 12 schools within a half mile of the tanks. There are also daycares, did I read this already? <laughs> Community centers and a senior housing. Many people have reported respiratory problems, headaches, dizziness, and nausea. People living near the tanks say they often have to keep their windows closed in the warm weather and the emissions prevent them from sitting in their yards, mowing their lawns, or riding bikes. A teacher at Kaler Elementary School spoke of there being hot days when she can't have the windows open in her classroom. 
People living and working in South Portland have serious concerns that go far beyond the bad odors from the tanks. Next slide, please. Hazardous air pollutants emitted from the tanks have been linked to respiratory problems, including asthma. They can damage the nervous system, liver, kidney, brain, and developing fetuses. Children, pregnant women, and the elderly are especially vulnerable. Exposure to air pollution has been linked to increased vulnerability to COVID-19. This is a social justice issue. People living around petroleum infrastructure have been described as living in sacrifice zones, while the oil industry and its investors reap huge profits. Many residents were shocked and outraged by the news that Global and Sprague had been violating clean air laws for years without accountability. Some spoke of having assumed that government regulators like the DEP were safeguarding their safety and health. Instead, it's been more like the Wild West with no sheriff in town. We have seen firsthand denial, delay, and obfuscation by the oil companies and regulators seeming to avoid transparency or accountability. When the news of the violations came out in March 2019, triggering a public outcry, the DEP set up monitoring in South Portland for the first time. They placed a monitor in each district to determine ambient air quality. Though no monitors were placed in the neighborhoods closest to the tanks, after 18 months, they are now beginning to use one mobile monitor to position on streets that are most affected. From the beginning, citizens have been asking for 24 seven fence line monitoring around the tank farms with continuous reporting to the public. We are also asking for the installation of technology that exists to monitor and capture emissions directly from the tanks. South Portland City Council created the Clean Air Advisory Committee to study the issue and make recommendations to the city. The state legislature passed a resolve introduced by Senator Millett, LD 1915, requiring the DEP to study the best ways to monitor and control emissions from all above ground oil tank terminals in Maine. There are eight parts of Maine that have these terminals, including South Portland. The report with recommendations is due January 1st. We'll be looking to our state legislators to pass effective and strong regulations to ensure that we have clean air to breathe. Technology exists to effectively monitor and control 95% of emissions coming from these tanks. What is needed is the political will to do it. Thank you. I think we're going back to Maya and questions. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly just touch on a few things about the issues that we've just heard about, <clears throat> just briefly to try to give um, some sense of, you know, how a green amendment might work in these contexts. Um, the first thing, though, that I do want to make couple things I want to make clear. First up, I recognize that a green amendment is not an instant panacea, right? It's not going to solve all the problems and certainly not going to solve them all right away. But it does bring to bear the most powerful tool we have in the United States of America for the environment and environmental protection and now the newly recognized rights of the people to a clean and healthy environment. Um, and that's really powerful. This is a powerful tool, the constitutional tool, Bill of Rights tool that is missing from the toolbox. So while it's not an instant panacea, we are certainly upping our game. Um, and then the second thing though, I wanna also make clear is that the Green Amendment um, at, that's added to it, the state constitution will address state action, state government action. So when we're thinking about how we might use the Green Amendment as a sword or a shield, we want to remember that we need to find a state action or activity or a failure to act where they should have acted. That's going to be the hook that we use um, the Green Amendment for, 
right? We're not going to be able to use it to go after EPA or the federal government. That's why our longer term strategy requires um, the passage of a federal green amendment, because that's how we're going to get to the federal bad actors. But just really quick, broad brush. Um, Oh, I do think I just mixed the two stories. I was trying to add things in context. So we'll go back and forth a little bit. Um, so for the um, for the mining, let's just stop. Don't look at the LD 1915 because that was I added it to the wrong slide. Anyway, um, so one of the things that we heard in the mining story that Shelley talked about, you know, was how 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 environmentalists actually challenged the powerful advocacy that she and her communities were 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 advancing, saying, well, that they're too harsh. You're going to shut down all mining, right? And trying to drag the advocacy into the minutia of the battles over the mining and the mining laws. Well, when you have a green amendment, you're changing the frame entirely because now you're not just arguing about is this too harsh on industry or not, or what do other environmentalists think? But you're bringing it back to the fundamentals that people need clean water and clean air and healthy environments to survive and to thrive. So it really does change the framing of the advocacy from we're anti-mining to we're pro-people, we're pro-environment. And it's much more positive. You know, it's, it's a much more, um, not much more, but it is a powerful framing to use in opposition when people are trying to drag down your advocacy saying that you're somehow bitter or wicked. You can say, no, I'm positive and proactive because I actually care about people and I'm trying to protect them. Um, in Shelley's story, we heard about, she talked about the, the, the laws and how there were some bad aspects to the mining law that had been advanced and passed and some good things, right? That it banned open pit mining over three acres, but that means that you allow it if it's under three acres. And so there was this back and forth. Well, you know, remember our, our Act 13 story, there was a law and actually there were some elements in the law where they were, they were in fact gonna hold the fracking industry more accountable, more accountable, not properly accountable, but more accountable on an, um, the economic front. Um, but there were these fundamentally horrific elements of the law where we were use, able to use the Green Amendment to challenge those bad elements of the law. And so in, in Shelley's mining story, one can consider um, all the things she talked about in the law, which really, um, if implemented as, as passed, um, as proposed and passed, would have had devastating consequences for the environment and environmental rights. You can hone in on those aspects of the law and challenge them with the with the Green Amendment. You don't have to challenge the whole law, you can just challenge um, the bad parts. Um, on the, um, and then, you know, to the extent that there is individual permitting that has to happen, right? Um, if you sort of miss the boat on challenging the whole law, every single time a permit is issued or reissued, that becomes an opportunity to think about a Green Amendment challenge and whether or not that particular permit is going to advance pollution and degradation that harms environmental rights. When we think about the Portland pipeline story, right, we heard Roberta talk about the, the Clean Skies Ordinance and all the challenges that it has and does face to this powerful ordinance that the township passed to try to help protect um, the clean air uh, of the community. If you have a Green Amendment, then those township officials have a constitutional duty to protect the environment, to protect the air, to protect the climate, and to protect the environmental rights of the people. So that constitutional grounding for that kind of powerful ordinance becomes a powerful tool that they could use in the courts to defend that proactive um, undertaking uh, in the passage of the ordinance. Um, when we think about the licenses that 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 were issued um, that allowed out of the state that allowed the pipeline to advance, right? We we there have a state action where a green amendment could perhaps be used. We heard Roberta talk about the failure to consider the science and the impacts um, on individual communities of the 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 construction and the operation 
implementation of the pipeline in that licensing process. Well, we have successfully used Pennsylvania's Green Amendment to challenge permits that were issued, right? That's a counterpart to a license. Permits that were issued in, in a variety of different contexts where we were able to demonstrate that the government failed to look at the science, failed to look at the impacts, meaning they failed to engage in informed decision making. Because under the Green Amendment language that Pennsylvania has and that we would be advancing in the state of Maine, because it creates a trust obligation, not public trust doctrine, but it, it, it makes the state the trustee of the natural resources for the benefit of all the people. It brings into play trust law, which includes fiduciary obligations on the trustee, one of which is you must engage in informed decision making. Think about it. If somebody's a trustee of a money trust, they can't just willy nilly throw your money around if you're the beneficiary and say, oh, they, that looks good. That looks good. I'll invest the money here and there. No, they have to do the research and say, what will be the ramifications of investing the money in this way? They have to prove that they engaged in that thoughtful decision making. Same thing comes to the environment. They have to prove they considered the science and the impacts of the issuance of the license. What would be the ramifications on the trust resources, which here is nature. So that becomes very, would have become a powerful place to use the Green Amendment potentially to challenge forward action on um, the pipeline. Also, just Roberta talked about a new law. I don't remember if you said 1915 or 1815, right? But there's a there's a powerful uh, law that's being advanced. Well, if there's a Green Amendment similar to the ordinance, that the Green Amendment could be sort of the grounding in which to um, the foundation on which to build that law. And so that just becomes a powerful advocacy tool to say to legislators, to, you have to fulfill your constitutional obligation and that means passing this law. It doesn't mean it'll always work, but it does hold sway because legislators, right? They, uh, they um, um, you know, take an oath to protect the constitution. So now the environment is in the constitution. So those are just some of the, some of the ways that jumped out to me in context of these two powerful issues and stories where a green amendment could have been, could be a tool that could be used. Yes, there are a lot more specifics than what I shared, but just again, broad strokes, trying to help you think about where would be the corners and the places and the spaces um, that this green amendment could come to bear. Now with that, I am going to turn to the chat and read the questions and divvy them up amongst the um, speakers. Um, I'm going to answer the one, the first question that I saw very quickly, which said, isn't fracking still doing a lot of damage in Pennsylvania? And yes, it is. Um, one of the things is that fracking got to Pennsylvania before we had a living, thriving Green Amendment. If the Green Amendment were given life first, I think we could have used it to keep fracking out because fracking was there first, we are now in this situation like Maine is with the mining, right? Having to go instance by instance by instance and prove the point that advancing fracking here and there and there will result in a constitutional violation. But every time we do that, we set a new precedent that applies to all the future fracking activities. So we start, to build a wall of defense that will over time increase the protections from the fracking industry. And remember by defeating Act 13, there was a whole, in fact, Act 13 was gonna mandate that fracking operations be allowed by virtue of state law to, to that operating fracking well pads could be built as close as 300 feet from, from people's homes and there was nothing that a town could do to stop that, we wiped out that provision from Act 13 and prevented that from happening, right? Big deal. So there was a, a big bang in the first instance of preventing harm, and now we're just having to use it to claw back ground. Um, we are having a lot of nice comments. 
um, but I want to find the questions. So um, I'm going to see if Shelly or Roberta or Andy, if any one of you want to answer this question, raise your hands and I will shoot it over to you. But here the question is, how can companies get away with manipulating local and national policies and laws so that those, especially diverse and indigenous peoples who are li actually living at the source of the energy project are not considered in the decision-making process of approving such a project? There are a lot of really good answers to that question. And I'm wondering if any one of the three of you have something that you would like to share in reaction. While you, go ahead, Andy. You're on mute. Can't hear you. Andy, you're on mute. Yeah, I, yeah. I am muted. Um, well, I'm thinking uh, in, in this regard, one of the issues that we are, are dealing with right now in the state, uh, which many of you are probably aware of, is <clears throat> there is legislation uh, that would actually um, have the state recognizing the sovereignty of um, our uh, tribal, um, uh, of the Wabanaki tribe, tribe, tribes. And I'm, uh, you know, if I understand the question, I think one of the pieces of this is uh, that uh, acceptance and recognition of uh, sovereignty that would um, actually become uh, law. I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but that's, that's sort of my first uh, reaction to that question. And I just want to add to that, and I think that that's really helpful, Andy. I just want to add, you know, one of the reasons why our government is allowed to get away with this is that's how the laws are written. That's how they're implemented. Um, and there is no constitutional backstop. So when government writes a law that allows them to ignore impacts, that allows them to target indigenous communities or communities of color, or they in fact, implement a law that carries that out and nobody in government stops them, the, as long as the government has complied with the letters of the law that they wrote, right, and that they're in charge of, there's not all that much that people can do. Sometimes state laws and federal laws have provisions that allow um, people like you and I to bring a lawsuit to enforce the laws that are on the books. And that can have a powerful impact. And we can, you know, hold government to account for failing to properly implement the laws on the books. But when the laws on the books fundamentally are written in order to allow pollution and degradation and environmental racism, that only gets you so far. And there is no backstop. By having this broad Bill of Rights provision where all the people have a right to pure water and clean air, a stable climate, and the environmental, scenic, cultural, and healthful values of the environment, and the government becomes duty bound to respect and protect those rights constitutionally, right? We now have created a strong backstop that people can use to hold government to account in those situations, right? So that's where the, the law, it happens because the law allows it to happen and people don't have the powerful tool they need to stop it. A green amendment provides, starts to provide that backstop. Um, here in the Q and A is, is the NRCM backing the main green amendment? Do you know, Andy? Uh, we have not had that conversation. Uh, we're still in the uh, early uh, early stages. I was going to talk a little bit about how things, uh, where things are are stand right at the moment. Uh, but uh, they were invited to come tonight to find out about uh, the Green Amendment, and I have talked to some some of the staff. Is if anybody from NRCM is in the audience, I'd love to hear an answer to that question. K 
Can you put it in the chat if you are from NRCM? We will look for that and I will keep going. Let me just zoom down, see if anybody added that they were. We got some thank yous, um, but I have not seen a post from NRCM yet, but we will keep our eyes open. Um, there, um, here uh, is how can a stable climate be used to prevent bad legislation when it is a worldwide rather than a national or a state problem? I think that's probably a question for me. If anybody wants to offer something before I offer my answer, raise your hand. Okay. So remember, again, like any constitutional um, Bill of Rights provisions, right? Free speech, freedom of assembly, um, civil rights. Um, there are all kinds of rights, right, that have, um, that, that span states, that span the nation. Um, and having a state enforce the, their obligation to protect the rights of the people within their state to free speech does not mean we solve all free speech problems in the nation and in other states. But what it does mean is that the state is holding itself to account for its contribution to the problem. So when you're thinking about climate, it's going to be the same thing. Yes, stopping climate change emissions and actions and activities that are exacerbating the climate crisis and can, can be said to rise to the level of being a constitutional violation in terms of the state's obligations, that's not going to solve the climate crisis nationally or worldwide. But it is going to mean that the state is not going to be contributing unconstitutionally to the problem. Now, what that looks like in different contexts is going to mean different things. For example, they're going to have to engage in informed decision making. They're going to have to look at the science right now. When you see fossil fuel decision making, I don't care in Maine or anywhere, right? The climate is not being given due consideration, nor is climate science. That's going to have to be brought to bear on the, on the decision making process. So are the cumulative impacts, including the contribution to the climate crisis and what the climate crisis means for environments and communities in the state of Maine. And then also when you look at, you know, the sheer volume of what's being allowed and what is allowable in state decision making, right? That's all going to now have a place in a constitutional context. So now, we're not going to solve the climate crisis by Maine holding Maine accountable to its constitutional obligations. But if we have every single state having a constitutional green amendment and all the states are now being held accountable and then we get a federal green amendment and the federal government's going to be held accountable we're still not going to solve the worldwide climate crisis but we're certainly going to be a big part of the solution so it's about holding ourselves and our own states mm -hmm. accountable for what <clears throat> our behaviors and that's appropriate and that's right in the constitutional context um there is an encouragement. Oh, yeah, we put it in there. Um, we want to remind everybody to sign up for the PSP newsletter. I don't know, Roberta, if you want to talk quickly what that is and what people will get by signing up, but we have a link in the chat box. And uh, we'll make sure people do that. Um, I'm sorry. It, it's, um, I think there's a link to our website where people can sign up for the newsletter, and it would be a way that they can stay informed with what actions we are involved in on this issue and what people can do, um, you know, when, when we're advocating with the legislature and things like that, so. Um, I do want to ask Andy, we are getting over our one hour time frame, so I'd like to ask you to make an executive decision when you'd like to stop. Um, but otherwise I'll keep going through the questions. Yeah? You're on mute. One or more, or one or two more questions. I think there's, people are still quite interested and we have you here, which is uh, uh, a wonderful, uh, but you know, Andy, I'll always be here for you and Michelle I and me. Know. I know. I'm an active partner in this. So anybody who has questions, right, we will um, circle back and maybe talk about doing another session 
where we can really get people um, get their questions answered. So I want to let everybody know I'm not going away. How about one more, uh, Maya? Is there one that just rises that as you've gone through? Uh, yeah. So I think that this is a good one that might 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 um, yield some a little bit of input from each of the panelists. So you know, what do you? What do you and I'm going to do it frame it a little bit differently than than Michelle wrote it, but thinking about what's happening at the federal level with the United States Supreme Court and how that court is really poised to go very anti environment. What do you think it might mean for the state of Maine to have this higher level constitutional protection for the environment, recognizing that the federal government that maybe sometimes was a friend, sometimes not, is less likely to be a friend more and more frequently on environmental protection and the issues that you work on. Andy, oh, Roberta, you go first. You got <laughs> I'm sorry. Go first. Yeah. Well, all I could say is my experience uh, has been that local, that we have much more potential for uh, having input and making a difference when we start locally and and that very that, that that there's the potential for when things start locally and change happens people around see that it changes and others might be able to take from that and and do it in their city or state or and that that's that's a way that people can have more um, impact. So, Shelly? Well, so, uh, you know, for me in the mining thing, a green amendment would have made a huge difference because it, it seems like an endless battle to me. Um, you know, going through all the different agencies, stop, trying to stop it at every turn and um, not always having everybody in the environmental community on board with protecting the environment. But I have a question for you, Maya, about the Supreme Court. Suppose we did have a green amendment in Maine and it was challenged to the US Supreme Court, especially now, could, could they, could, could a, green, a state level green amendment conflict with the federal constitution? So Andy, why don't I answer that really quickly and then you do our final overarching thoughts? Because that's a great question, Shelley. Um, so in the environmental context, yes, it, there are some areas of law um, and some where the government has made very clear under federal law or the federal constitution that the government is choosing to, um, to um, take over all the landscape, right, in that area of law. And so any state laws that would conflict with that federal law in that landscape, right, and pre pre prevent full and proper implementation of that federal law so that they indeed are in direct conflict, in those scenarios, yes, the state law will, will fall, right? It, it will not hold sway. And so if you have a situation where you can say the constitution is coming in direct conflict with um, federal legislation or the federal constitution um, and its implementation in the environmental context, then in that, in that uh, arena, in that moment, in that space, the Green Amendment at the state level would not hold sway. That being said, when it comes to environmental protection here in the United States of America, the, the laws have been, the system of government and the laws have been set up to recognize the um, important role state government plays in environmental protection and to preserve that special space um, of state government um, in the environmental arena. And so for the most part, for the most part, when it comes to environmental protection laws, the federal government puts in place the floor, right? The bare minimum um, protection of water, air, species, the environment that, that, that you cannot go beneath at the state level, but the states are empowered to do anything they want to that's more protective. 
And so that's where the Green Amendment comes to play. While the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and the Endangered Species Act provides the floor below which the federal government cannot go under, there's a whole lot of space above where the state can do better. And the Green Amendment occupies that space. There will be, and just like by way of example, in the context of interstate natural gas pipelines, a pipeline that goes from state to state that carries only natural gas, not liquids, but gas, um, and is regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that is one of those specific areas of law where the, the federal law is very clear that all state and local authorities are preempted. So that would be one of those limited spaces where you would have trouble using the Green Amendment to put in place to secure better decision making at the state level. But even there, even in that FERC regulated interstate natural gas pipeline context, there still is a role specially preserved for the states when it comes to um, advancing state water quality standards that they're obliged to put in place and carry out under the Federal Clean Water Act. So in that state space, the Green Amendment could come to bear even in that unique pipeline context. And in fact, in the Green Amendment, I specifically write about that issue. So if you're interested in it, but I hope that helps. There's a there's a whole world of opportunity for states to do it better when it comes to environmental protection. And that's the world that the Green Amendment grabs hold of for all of us. There will be some pockets and moments when the Green Amendment protection will have to fall um, if there's a conflict with the federal constitution or federal law, but those are going to be few and far between. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to ultimately get a federal Green Amendment, so that even in those places and spaces that can't really happen. I, I'm, I'm reading the chat and this has come up a few times, are people talking about the language of the Green Amendment, associating it with Bernie and AOC and how um, offensive that language is to a lot of people. So do you ever think about that and changing the way you phrase it so that, I don't know, it's hard not to offend. Yeah. <laughs> so, so first off, the Green Amendment existed before the Green New Deal. So I can't really help that they glommed onto my language and I didn't glom onto theirs. Um, that's number one. Number two, what we found in other states where we've talked about using other language because that has come up, there is always there is always a reason and excuse not to use this language, not to use that language. This is a problem. That's a problem. This is um, so. Truthfully, you're always going to have that that push and pull over what's exactly the right language to use. Um, I think that the Green Amendment at this point has actually garnered a lot of power and a lot of attention and a lot of recognition and a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of inspiration. And so while yes, absolutely, we're still gonna have to make have those times where we have to make very clear, the Green New Deal is an entirely different idea and it's an entirely different concept and it's about policies and programs and funding that the state government or the federal government has to pass for environmental protection. And there too, when they pass sucky laws and sucky programs or they don't do a good job, right? We're going to suffer from the same problem that we suffer now um, when our governments pass sucky laws and sucky programs and sucky policies, right? And that's, you know, and, and still there, that, that, that constitutional environmental rights amendment has that powerful, has that powerful role. Because the Green Amendment language is, 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 is the name of the book, is being, um, used in so many places and so many spaces and so many states, it is creating a synergy so that actually when people go on and search hashtag green amendment or the green amendment or a green amendment, if you were to go do a Google search right now, the first few pages is entirely our green amendments for the generations movement or me or my book or my work with partners um, like all the folks on this 
on this webinar. So I think that the synergistic values and powerful benefits at this point outweigh the fact that for some people, we're still going to have to explain. A lot of people confuse the Green Amendment with rights of nature, and they confuse the Green Amendment with the um, the um, our children's trust litigation, and they there it gets confused with a lot of different things for a lot of different kinds of reasons where the terminology is entirely different. And so all we do is we take that as an opportunity to educate about the differences. If ultimately people want to say, well, in Maine, we want to call it something different, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. What I would suggest though, is you will lose the benefits that comes from using Green Amendment. Because again, if you go do a Google search right now, you will see how much traction it already has in the public arena. Long answer to an important question. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, I wondered, uh, Colleen, if you could put up uh, the slide, because uh, I wanted to just give a quick um, update to people about where things uh, stand right now and where we're going. Um, I've seen a number of questions in the chat and some uh, good advice. Uh, about uh, how to proceed, uh, that we really need a good uh, example, a good story and hook uh, to move this forward. And what I wanted to, I'm hoping that uh, people will uh, look at these, um, how to get involved um, and, and there are different ways. R right now we have a petition uh, to just find uh, the public, uh, out there to really build the momentum of people interested in what a green amendment would be. It has um, both the language, the draft language that we have, as well as uh, the rationale behind um, uh, what we've created so far. But our plan right now is, uh, and this is working with, um, Chloe Maxman, who is running for um, state senate, but um, and she's sorry not to be here tonight. But with two weeks to go, she's deep in the throes of of election. Um, but the plan is to introduce a bill uh, in the legislature uh, for this upcoming session. Uh, I feel like this is an amazing um, election opportunity and we could well get uh, an op optimal representation in the legislature to pass a bill. It will take two thirds of the legislature to move a, a green amendment forward uh, in Maine. Then it goes out to referendum. And as Sue Inches, who is, um, uh, is participating uh, in this and asked the question and, and was talking about a hook. She was saying in order for it, when it becomes a referendum to go out to the voters of Maine, we really have to have a compelling story. And so um, our sort of first focus is on uh, the legislature, but I, we, uh, Michelle and I, uh, we've kind of been carrying the ball ourselves. We uh, got this started uh, a year ago, then COVID came and um, we have been doing a cons uh, consultative process, uh, as I said before, with um, leaders in the tribes, as well as with youth activists. We felt like it was really important uh, for some of those who have, uh, felt have been in sacrifice zones or who are uh, concerned that they have no uh, future due to climate crisis, we wanted them to come forward and give us their ideas um, in the beginning. So um, we're looking at uh, December is when uh, closure will happen and uh, we will submit a bill 
We actually are uh, going to um, have a webinar for Maine legislators that's done by the National uh, Caucus for Environmental Legislators. That will be happening um, in um, later in November after elections or in December. And um, so we're really trying to <clears throat> mobilize this and would love all of your help. Um, we think this is a really exciting opportunity and a uh, bold vision uh, for Maine to grab hold of. We are, after all, dear ago, we lead. And this is a way that joining together in this movement that Maya has uh, created, uh, we can learn from one another across states and really be um, powerful uh, in that local sense that Roberta said. I, I've always felt one of the most powerful photographs I've ever seen was a group of South Portland people with a banner that said, we stopped tar sands. They put a plug a little, a community here in Maine put a plug and stopped the flow of tar sands from uh, the impacted, devastated First Nations communities in Alberta. And that is how we have, we have to come together to do this. So I wanna end tonight. Uh, I hope people will contact me and Michelle, go find uh, information, circulate petitions, et cetera. Uh, and it's all up there on the screen. Uh, but I wanted to, to finish this evening with some wise words from Penobscot leader, Sherry Mitchell. And I am taking this to heart in these times. Uh, she has a formula for working for the earth community that we want to inhabit. And that formula is to spend 80% of our time focused on working towards the vision that we want. And for me, uh, at this moment in time, bringing a Green Amendment movement and a Green Amendment to Maine is where I want to put my 80% of my time. Um, so thank you so much to the panelists to those of you who were able to join us. And um, we will stay in touch with Maya and keep bringing her great wisdom and knowledge and passion uh, and so on uh, into our communities and uh, work together uh, going forward. So I hope people have a wonderful rest of your night. I hope this has been an inspiring moment there's an awful lot out there when you open the papers that doesn't feel great, but this feels really good. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>